The ancient Egyptians were eminently practical, and so they came up with a solution to a huge challenge, how to lay out a pyramid of 13 acres so it's accurately oriented to the north. So to cut to the chase here, it was done through successive approximations. These arrows point to systematic holes along the pyramid's east side, and they were used to lay out the pyramid. Okay, now the best way to lay out a pyramid to true north is to be able to make the pyramid diagonal square on the Giza Plateau. And then you have your meridian line that's pointing to the north be square with the pyramid. So the whole pyramid will be pointed to the north. And so if you can put the diagonals in, you can, you know, get a huge square like the Great Pyramid is relatively close because it is relatively close. Now, I built a, uh, a kid's playhouse in my backyard in Tennessee. So I laid it out onto a foundation, you know, that would look like the base of the Great Pyramid. And the way that I checked for square after I had built the frame at the base is I measured three feet along one side of the foundation, four feet along the other side, and then I connected those two with the tape measure to see if it was exactly five feet because a Pythagorean triangle is going to do that. And that's a rough way to check for square. And I did that. And yet, when I finished this house, I was almost two inches off square, a little bit over an inch. But, uh, you know, you cover for it, you know, so you can't tell by looking at the shed once you're there. But I know that it was two inches off of square. Now, compare that with the Great Pyramid, okay? So somebody laid that out, you know, just like I laid out my shed. The Great Pyramid was only two finger widths off of square over the length of a football field. Incredible. Okay, so that would be the top view. Now, an elevation view, looking at the side view of that, looks like this. Okay, so uh, the diagonals couldn't be used to lay out the Great Pyramid because of what we just showed you in that diagonal. The bedrock was there. You couldn't just go straight across flat ground. That square wasn't leveled first because it wasn't flat. There was bedrock. There was bedrock underneath it. So again, this is the side view of the Great Pyramid, but you can see what this diagram says is natural rock from the service shaft, known as the well shaft. We can see in there that there's bedrock, natural rock, up to seven meters, over 20 feet high into the pyramid. We know from the descending passage that's at least three meters high at that point, and we know by the outside of the pyramid, looking through the stones that are there, you can see the natural rock from the outside, and that's four meters tall. So, and then it's possible in other areas that it could be, have been much higher. Those three red arrows I showed you are just places we can actually see it. Could have been much higher, okay? So you can't lay a flat diagonal over a hill like that. The Great Pyramid was built on a core massif, meaning the mountain itself, natural rock. So Mark Lehner uh, wrote a paper, Some Observations on the Layout of the Khufu and Khafre Pyramids. So he studied how, how did they do this? You know, they laid it out so closely. And to make a long story short, he uses this expression five to seven times in his paper, successive approximations. So they weren't able to do a single perfect layout because of the core massive there. So they first laid out this platform and they tried to get that square and level. And they did it by these post holes that I showed you there. And then they eventually built a tr water trough in there and then they could cut these off to level. And they did this several times, getting closer and closer to having an actual square. But the square of, of this the corner that I'm showing you here wasn't built with a single snap line. It was built with successive approximations. OK, so that's one idea of how they got it so close. Being very practical, they just just sort of like you can make a circle through making a bunch of straight lines. And if you do it enough times, you know, you'll have a circle. Glenn Dash's idea was they leveled that bedrock that I showed you, that mountain, the, the, the natural mountain. They did level just the top of that. And then they put the diagonals there. So on top of, you know, there would be the meridian to the north. And then there would be the diagonals they put just on the, the level part of the bedrock that they put on top, okay? So, because that was, you know, the, the top view I showed you, but the side view would be, okay, here's the, the base of the pyramid that they laid out through successive approximations or whatever. Okay, so there's the core massif, the core mountain, the natural rock that's there. Okay, and so then they would level that off, Glendash said, 
Okay, and do that. And then, now that you've got a level top, not of the whole pyramid, but just of the bedrock, okay, then you can put the diagonals on top of that flattened rock. Okay, right there. So, Glenn Dash wrote a paper, what was the original size of the Great Pyramid's footprint? So, using these, trying to get at where the original layout was, so uh, he shares the results from a 2015 survey that he, that he did with, with uh, ERA, uh, Mark Lehner's group. And so here's a top view of the northeast corner of the Great Pyramid, okay, uh, th from three different places. So this would be the corner view, looking at the northeast corner of the Great Pyramid. Now that's, you know, an elevation view, but our uh, architectural drawing here is the top view. Okay, so that corner right there, that was a socket corner. The pyramid didn't go out that far, but they built a socket to help lay out the other parts. That would be way out here. So there's this, this outer socket that they used. And then there's the platform level right there. And then there's the actual extent of the pyramid itself, the casing lines, where the right uh, white Tura limestone casing stones went. And that would actually, you know, rim right around the pyramid. Okay, so what Glenn Dash found in, uh, well, first of all, this pin was placed by Mark Lehner. You can actually see that on the Giza Plateau. You see how it's in northeast of the existing Great Pyramid. Here's a close-up of it right there. You can see that. Just go to the northeast side of the Great Pyramid if you visit it, and you'll see that pin. It's called G11. It's the master uh, benchmark for measuring, uh, surveying the whole pyramid. So where is the north e northeast corner? That's what Glenn Dash set out to find. So that point right there is where Flinders Petrie said it was in 1883. Now, he's a highly respected Egyptologist, the father of Egyptology, really, and uh, highly respected today, even the measurements he took back then. So his 1888, 1880, 1883 point for the northeast corner was there. The coal survey, which was done with the Egyptian government in 1925, also considered a very accurate survey, put the northeast corner right there. And then Glenn Dash, in his survey, put it right there of 2015. So you can see that the Dash, the Petri, and the coal survey are all really within inches of each other. So that exactly where the Great Pyramid is, we can't say for sure, and that's important to recognize because these are the best surveys that, that we can get, and it shows that there are a few inches difference. So no one's gonna be able to perfectly say what the exact size of the Great Pyramid is. Theoretically, there may be a theoretical value that we can deduce that the original architect, Hemiunu, or Enoch, or whoever it was that they used but we can't prove that. So the Great Pyramid is a, is a finite object on Earth. Its ultimate dimensions are ultimately unknown, but we know them very closely. It's sort of like pi, the value of pi. So the conclusion that uh, uh, Glenn Dash came to, our survey has produced new estimates for the size and orientation of the Great Pyramid. We also continue to analyze the data for new insights. We've not been disappointed. The data showed the Egyptians possessed quite remarkable skills for their time. Okay, so lessons from the Great Pyramid here. So successive approximations, that's the way the pyramid was ultimately laid out so that it was square and then facing to the north. So the analogy I draw from that, the lesson, the moral lesson, if we could say, is that in our growth, as we grow, because heading toward north, being oriented correctly, is a symbol of ha having your life live like the compass needle to the pole, that we live true to duty to our calling, live righteously, live uh, it, with, the, with the highest consciousness possible, that that takes place through successive approximations. We learn, we grow, we make mistakes, we take a step backward, we take two forward. That's how growth takes place. There's not this automatic, immediate, okay, we level the Great Pyramid and orient it to north in one second. No, it takes time. So that's, that's the first idea. And just generally here, the holes on the Giza pavement, which indicate how the Egyptians oriented the Great Pyramid, so these holes are examples of the ones that were used here, are the same kind of marks which I show have symbolic value. So like that mark right there, which I call the, you know, the two parallelograms, okay? You can see it there. And what I, just as an example for this one, if you've watched my programs, you've seen these before, but that line points right to Abydos and that point that side of that parallelogram points to Luxor. It's amazing. I never would have thought that, but when I laid it out, put it on Google Maps, you can see where two parallelograms are there, and I followed the angles of those lines. Bingo. There it is. 
from the two parallelograms pointing down to the Temple of Seti I, which is in Abydos, and this one pointing to the Mortuary Temple of Seti I, which is in Karnak. So incredible. You know, it seems like when I, when I study those markings, they hit pay dirt. They're making commentaries. So the marks on the plateau tell a story. Some were guides the building, as we showed, and some were commentaries and symbols. I've done a program on the keyhole. I'll do one on that and, and uh, probably on the parallelogram. Okay, thanks for watching. There's things to learn from Giza.